So, uh, so welcome to Semper Sometimes with Benny. So um, I've got Chad Robichaux with us. Um, I've been talking to him since June. Um, been DM DM back and forth with him, and um, you know, I was really affected by a lot of the things that he's doing. Um all over Instagram around the world. And, um, you know, I was able to actually just get in touch with them. And, you know, I want to first thank you for that, you know, being someone that, you know, you've been praying with me, you've been talking through me, giving me guidance on different things. And I, that just alone means a lot to me. So I want to thank you for that. Um, so for the audience who doesn't know you, can you introduce yourself and kind of give us a background on who you are? Yeah, yeah. my name is Chad Robichaud. I'm a former Fort Street Con Marine. And I uh, had the honor to serve and represent the Marine Corps at JSOC Task Force and did eight, eight deployments to Afghanistan in that capacity. And, uh, you know, after coming back from Afghanistan and really facing some of my own struggles, I, uh, I ended, up, ended up getting on the other side of those things and uh, had a burden on my heart to share the lessons I learned and the ways forward that I found with other, other military warriors. And that, uh, that manifested in the founding of Mighty, Mighty Oaks Foundation, which was uh, over over 10 years ago now, and, uh, and been able to do, speak to over 250,000 active duty troops on lessons of resiliency. I've written a couple of books and been really honored, you know, speaking events to give away books to the troops. I've given away about 150,000 copies of my books to the troops. Uh, one of them is a bestseller, uh, An Unfair Advantage. Uh, and then we have a recovery program, Mighty Oaks Foundation, where we help active duty service members, veterans, spouses, as well as first responders uh, who are coming home and or just dealing with military life struggles. We help them uh, through a program we have called the Legacy Program. We run, we run those programs about 35 times a year now. They're one week camps followed by aftercare and they run by other veterans. So it's kind of peer to peer mentoring program. And, Active duty military comes to it on orders, uh, as well as veterans from the veteran community against spouses and first responders. And uh, we've had about 4,000 graduates over the last 10 years, although we're doing about 1,000 per year now. And, uh, and the cool thing about it is it's free. We pay for everything. We do about $4 million a year, 3 to $4 million a year in programming. And uh, it's all paid for by some amazing Americans who, uh, who love our vet warriors and donate to make that possible. Uh, when I say it's free, we even pay for travel. Uh, so if any veterans are listening, as you hear this, kind of let's talk about it more. And if something you're interested in, you could go to mightyoaksprograms.org and learn more about it. Sign up for the programs, and we'd love to have you. And the last thing about kind of uh, what I get to do at Mighty Oaks is is I get to uh, really speak on behalf of the veteran community because of the successes we've had with peer-to-peer faith-based programs. I get to speak on behalf of uh, the veterans community in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I've been very honored to affect policy, testify before Congress on faith-based programs, uh, worked with Senate on Senate bills, and, uh, and then I, the last administration appointed me to be the chairman of the uh, White House's Veterans Faith-Based Coalition. So I was able to help uh, with President Trump's uh, decision to change the executive order, assign executive order, bring faith-based programs back into the VA and DOD. They provide some, provide some uh, implementation and consultation for that in the prevents bill. Um, so, you know, got to take the solutions that we found at Mighty Oaks and help bring them to Washington, D.C. on a systemic level for the DOD and the Veterans Administration. And then, uh, and then now we could probably talk about it separately, but now I'm also working on a, an evacuation of Afghanistan through uh, an organization we stood up called Save Our Allies. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, I think that's like the hugest thing going on right now. And it's just yeah. so, it's so amazing what you've already done and just watching, following you guys on Instagram and following you guys, like just, just, so what put that on your heart? Like for you to create that, like, how did that all come about? It's actually, uh, it actually started kind of selfishly to be honest with you. I, uh, I, I really want to help get my interpreter out my, my, uh, my interpreter's name is Aziz. If you read my books, uh, I refer to him as Bashir in my books, kind of protecting his identity. Yeah, yeah. But his, his name, his name was, his real name is Aziz. I could say it now. And uh, Aziz and I did not only eight deployments together as a traditional interpreter, but because of being in a AFO at a JSOC unit, he was really embedded with me as a, not just an interpreter, but like an operator. Oh, so wow. He, he worked uh, hand in hand with uh, 
with me and everything I did. And when we were out, you know, doing our operations, we were working together and he kept me safe and he saved my life multiple times. I can name three times specifically that he literally saved my life, saved the lives of my friends and many, many American service members uh, operationally. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, I felt like I had a life debt to him to help him. And this is a guy, again, I'll, I'll go a little further in that. This is a guy that not only, um, I didn't only operate with and on the battlefield, but like when, when we were done operating, I didn't go back to the base at, at Bagram or anything like that. I went, I lived in his home, you know, he oh, wow. his family, he's played soccer with his kids. So it's very close <laughs> to these, like, uh, you know, I love him. He lo- I mean, we're like brothers and, and, uh, I would have died for him and he would have died for me. Like that kind of relationship. And so when, when I you know, got home, we stayed in touch and I've over the next years for six years. Sorry. Uh, over the next, over the next like six years, I mean, over the last six years, I tried to get him an SIB, special immigrant visa for interpreters. And it's just a broken system and it's not sort of set up to succeed. And he, uh, he wasn't getting his visa. So I said, man, President Biden's going to pull our, our military from Afghanistan and I got to go get him before that happens. And so I, I uh, made the decision to, you know, go get Aziz, his wife and his six kids. And in the process of doing that, I had to put a team together. And uh, that started with uh, my friend, Dan Stenson, who really kind of was a big part of the decision because he worked with Aziz as well. And then we started putting the guys together, uh, resource together we ended up putting a team about 12 people together put some financial resources together to do it and uh and we uh in the middle of planning we recognized that aziz wasn't the only person that needed help uh, other people were going to need help too and one of the one team member particularly identified a group of about three thousand orphan kids and we said man if we're going to go do this for aziz and his family we have the means we have the ability we have the resources and know how let's uh let's help more people let's help these kids and, uh, and we knew we weren't going to get the support of the United States government, um, maybe the allowance, but not the support. So we went to the United Arab Emirates because we had some relationships there. One of our team members is a very close relationship with the royal family. And they agreed to support us. They gave us, and it really did support us, like rolled out the red carpet, gave us a place to have our joint operations center, gave us an airstrip uh, to take off and, you know, to, to go back and forth to Kabul out of gave us two C-17 planes with pilots and the access to the humanitarian center. And so we went all in and, and executed a plan to do recover as many American citizens, SIV applicants and their families, women that would be vulnerable to, you know, to abuse, children that were orphaned and Christians that we persecuted. Those are groups we went after. We, uh, we were able to triage a very large list of you know, thousands, about 30,000 in one week and categorize them and launched for uh, rescue operations in, in 10 days, because we only had 10 days at the airport before it was shut down. In 10 days, we got out 12,000 people. And that was, uh, and then after that, the airport, you know, the US military pulled out of the airport, you know, the Taliban completely took over. Wow. And so, yeah, that was, and then since then, we've been, we've continued to do uh, flights out of remote parts of Afghanistan, averaging about 50 a day. I think right now, this week alone, we did about a thousand. So right now we're between two and three thousand more. So we're between a total of fourteen and fifteen thousand people uh, that we've <laughs> that we've gotten out wow. of, of, of Afghanistan. And then, you know, in addition, we've done other stuff like going and uh, going and do you know ground reconnaissance in Afghanistan to look at other operate you know ways to get out. And uh, so yeah, it's been it's been an incredible last eight weeks, very busy. Uh, most days overseas are 22, 23 hour days. Uh, but the reward has been incredible. I mean, uh, I can give you so many stories of people that we've been able to help, but, uh, you know, this, just, just two nights ago, these two little girls had sent me a picture of themselves recently and they, and they drew a coloring book and in the cover of it, it said, you know, you know, have my name, Chad, please save us. And, and uh, we were able to get them out and I got a cool little video from them and their father and uh so it, it's just you know these these are two little girls that would have been i mean say what you want about afghanistan but every woman in afghanistan right now is identified as a sex slave in my opinion you know 40 million people 20 million women these little girls would have been uh would have been you know forced into, into marriages and so 
you know, for me, not as an American, as a human being, I feel I I have, because I have the ability to help, I feel I have a moral obligation to help. And that's we, that's why we've chosen to do it. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, is I, I, so the way I found out about you was you did a conference for 8412s, the career recruiters. And, um, one of my buddies, Massar Eichler, he was the one that reached out to me about you and told me about you. And, um, <clears throat> and that's when I messaged you and he was telling me something about, um, stepping, I, if I get this correctly, stepping off the X. Yeah. Yeah. Could you yeah, get, maybe yeah, elaborate? Get, yeah. It kind of comes from a story, uh, during my time as a AFO, I was, you know, driving in Kabul and we were, uh, just outside of Kabul and on, by, on Jalal by road, we were in a Hilux pickup truck. And I mean, we, actually I was in a Toyota Prada, a Toyota four, like a Toyota four and like a similar, you know, and we had a Hilux pickup truck we thought was following us. And it was loaded with guys that looked like, you know, the Taliban and, uh, you know, AK 47s and we had seen an RPG, a rocket propeller grenade launcher. And, you know, all guys that look wear tribal clothes and big beards definitely look like the Taliban. And I always say a joke when I speak, you know, how many, give you an idea how many in the truck is how many Taliban can you fit in the pickup truck? The answer, the answer is one more. <laughs> the truck. And so, so they, they were like, they, they were uh, pretty sure they were following us, but to make sure they wasn't like, you know, I deviated my route, went off the job of my road, made the block. And when I got back on, they were definitely following us. And once that, once I did that, it all, you know, didn't just confirm it, but it also let them know that I knew they were following us. So it started a pretty aggressive pursuit. And, uh, and I went into the city of Kabul to lose them in the busy traffic. And I got to in a major intersection called Masood Circle. And when I got to Masood Circle, the traffic just congested and began to stop. And there was one little pathway I was trying to squeeze through and somehow they got in front of me and cut me off and roadblocked me in. And, and uh, that's the X that we're talking about. And, you know, that story, your friend, your friend mentioned, you know, the X is the ambush site. It's a kill zone. You know, a couple of things you learn in training about the X is and rule number one, you have to get off the X. Uh, or you, rule number one, you have to recognize you're an X. Rule number two, you have to get off the X, right? You're going to move or something bad's going to happen. And then in the military, you train for every possible scenario you can face in combat. That's what the repetitions training is all about. You know, every year we go to Bill Sky Raceway and do the driving training and the counter pursuit training, and we train for that scenario. Roadblock situation, you execute a ramming technique. And uh, so I did exactly what I was trained to do. I hit my gas and I aimed my vehicle towards theirs. Probably one of my favorite memories of Afghanistan is when I smashed in that truck, was seeing little Taliban guys fly out the back of it. A few of them jumped right before I hit it, spun out of the way, and you know, we ended up getting off that intersection that day. And uh, when I'm talking to guys like I talked to at the recruiting station there, you know, I kind of used that story of getting off the X as a, uh, a parallel to, to life. You know, you don't, we don't have to go to Afghanistan, Iraq, and find ourselves an X in life and, get caught in the suit circle from a, a roadblock by a Taliban trying to ambush you in life. We're going to find ourselves on X from time to time uh, in a situation where we choose whether we have to make a choice where they're going to stay there and die either literally or metaphorically, or we're we going to get off the X and move forward. And, uh, you know, for me, I had, a uh, felt like I did that well in combat and times of, you know, times of stress and combat and operationally. When it came to my personal life, I didn't make those same decisions. You know, when I came home, when my eighth and last deployment was diagnosed with PTSD, essentially I found myself on the X again. I didn't follow those two simple rules. I didn't identify I was on the X. I didn't want to admit my condition. And uh, because of that, I chose to stay on the X for a period of almost three years. Wow. And it, it almost cost me everything. Uh, it led to me, you know, facing a, you know, dealing with debilitating panic attacks and anxiety and depression and frustration and being very angry and irritable kind of lashing out of my family and, and just not getting well and uh, ultimately almost ending in a, in a divorce. And, uh, and then and at my lowest point, I had made a decision that uh, my family would be sad without me, but they would be better off. And I had decided I was gonna take my life. And, and you know, I remember that time I would, I would put my family pictures on the floor around me and I had my Glock 22 pistol. Um, uh, 40 caliber pistol and I would be in the closet in my apartment alone because I, I was separated from my family at a time and I you know I tried to have the courage to you know put that gun in my head pull the trigger and the, the one thing that kept me not from doing it was uh was uh because I had already concluded that I wanted to like I said I came to that thought that 
maybe, maybe my family would be sad without me, but they'd be better off. And so I thought that was the right decision for them. But every time I put that gun to my head, I, I would have this overwhelming thought of who's going to find me. And, uh, you know, I thought my son, Hunter, who was the only person besides me that had a key in my apartment, would be either find me or he'd be part of finding me. And that was enough in that moment to kind of pump the brakes. But I was in such a dark place. The next day I was back at it, trying to build up the courage to do it again. And in that, in that, uh, during that time, uh, there was one morning I was in that closet with a pistol in my hand and I heard a knock on my door. I was not going to answer it, but I heard my wife's voice uh, yell for me. And when I heard her voice, I kind of panicked and I hid the pistol like a little kid getting caught doing something wrong. I hid it under a blanket and we answered her door. And I was like extremely irate because I was really upset that she had interrupted me, which sounds crazy, but I was inter- upset she interrupted me for trying to kill myself. And, uh, you know, I was really bothered that she was there and I was yelling at her like, what she was doing there and, and uh, throwing a fit. In the middle of that argument, she asked me a question that really radically changed my life. She asked me how I could do everything I did, you know, in the Marine Corps. She saw me become a recon Marine and she saw me go to, you know, training and these deployments and all this stuff, the workups and all this stuff that we would do in the Marine Corps and including deploying. And then she saw me my professional life, you know, as also a professional athlete. She saw me get ready for professional MMA fights and things like that. And she's like, she really just saw like a lot of discipline in my life. So she was saying, how could you do all of that? And when it comes to your family, you'll quit. And uh, you know, for me, there's no more soul cutting word. We call the quitter. And uh, she was absolutely right. I had been for successful professional things in my life. But when it came to the most important things, being a husband, being a father. It, I, I quit in all those things. Those successful professional things like being a recon Marine and being an athlete, and, you know, doing other, you know, achieving, a, achieving a lot of like accolades and goals and stuff. But it came to the very most important things in my life. I quit, including, including long I don't know if you can hear me, but I lost you. Disconnected complete. So the last thing uh, you were just talking about how you... Yeah, you were just talking about how you, um, where you have never quit in life and your wife had asked you why quit on your family if you've done everything you did overseas and while in the military. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was getting into uh, accountability. Yeah, so, so I had really surrounded myself by people that told me everything I wanted to hear, not what I needed to hear. And I, I just needed some, I needed some accountability. I, don't, I personally don't believe there's any more dangerous place to be in the world than be without a, accountability. And, and I had intentionally put myself in that position. So um, I uh, decided to get help and, and I knew I needed accountability to make those changes. And so I asked my wife if there was someone at church she was going to, she was really had surrounded herself with some really quality people in the church at that time. I asked if there was a church she was going to that she could, uh, she could find uh, someone, some man that would hold me accountable. And she, and she, called the church and found this elder there. His name was Steve Toth. I met him at a Starbucks coffee shop. And uh, we really had not, not a lot of comedy. He didn't have, he ha- hadn't served in the military. He wasn't an, you know, an MMA fighter or anything like that. And, uh, you know, he just happened to be an elder on call at the church that day. And uh, he ended up being just a perfect guy to help me. I mean, he, his boldness and directness was just exactly what I needed to hear at that moment. I had, I had really like, was trying to manipulate the situation. I had written a, a plan 
kind of military style wrote a five paragraph order like operation plan about <laughs> life and it was really good and i was really proud of it and I really smugly it's like smugly like with an attitude slid it over to him and really what i was looking for was for him to show it to my wife to try to win her back at the time kind of wanting to use them maybe and uh i remember like i was super offended because he just didn't even look at it he put his hand in a paper and slid it back to me and, and told me i was going to fail and i remember being like what a jerk like I can even take the time to look at this thing. And he telling me I'm going to fail. Like, and he, he tapped on the paper and he said, if this plan doesn't have anything to do with your relationship with God, I'm not going to waste your time. And I'm not going to let you waste mine. And, uh, and I don't, I'm not even sure what kind of audience you have or yeah. you have people in the audience or not. But uh, I can tell you for me, like at that time in my life, uh, I was so far away from any relationship with God or having any, any kind of spiritual foundation. Uh, I could have asked but if I was a Christian, I would have said yes. I would have always said that, but I really had no depth of faith at all, a personal relationship with God. And I knew that, you know, I, I get to teach a lot in the Marine Corps now, and we talk about the pillars of resiliency, which are four pillars, you know, mind, body, spirit, social, being mentally tough, physically tough having a strong spiritual foundation, socially surrounding yourself with the right people. Right. I felt like I had all those boxes checked, but the truth is like, if you think of those four pillars of resiliency as like a four legged stool and uh, maybe you have all four of those legs, maybe you have, you know, mind, body, you have a spiritual foundation you claim and uh, socially around the right people. But if one of those legs are, are weak, while they may appear to be good, once you put weight on them, they'll come crack, you know, come crashing down that's what i feel my life was like like i was mentally tough i was physically tough uh socially like when i deployed i was with the you know the top tier one special operations unit on the battlefield like i was with the right people and uh spiritually you know i had to wear christian stamp on my dog tag but that pillar that leg of that stool really wasn't that strong it was weak and so when the weight of life came got pushed on top of that stool that's the leg that broke and i came crashing down and so I kind of knew that. And uh, so as he told me, like, this plan doesn't have anything to do with relationship with God. I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not going to let it waste mine. I'm like, well, I tried everything else. I tried medication, uh, you know, being on pills for PTSD. I tried counseling, uh, VA programs. I tried professional success, both by having status, you know, winning a world championship as an MMA fighter be getting accolades and people lifting me up. I had financial prosperity. Like I tried everything. And some of those things were good and some of the things were bad, but none of those things really changed my situation. And uh, we have a saying at Mighty Oaks Foundation that comes out of this that moment. If what you're doing isn't working, then why not try something different? Everything I tried didn't work. So why not try something different? Why not give this God thing a chance, faith a chance? Why not focus on this spiritual pillar, the pillar that I knew was missing? And so I did. And I, Surrender my life to Christ uh, through the mentorship of Steve. And beyond that decision, beyond that decision, Steve mentored me for an entire year oh, wow. in biblical living. And what, what I really discovered during that year, a couple of things that were profound. One is that I discovered that all the, all kind of, There's some bad things that as bad as they were, the pistol man would let me there with the choices that I made in response to those things. And I never in all that time I lost the ability to choose and make decisions in my own life. And so it was a it was a point of per, taking personal responsibility for the situation I was in and not blaming it on my circumstances. Whether I was a, a victim of them or not, it doesn't matter. I had to take ownership of them. And so in doing that and taking control of those ability to choose, you know. Making a decision. I'm on the X now. I'm going to recognize I'm on the X and I'm going to make a decision to get off. How do I get off? Well, I need to make the right choices. The choices I was making before wasn't the right choices. And what the biblical mentorship provided for me was allow me to have a set of a blueprint, kind of a model to make better choices from. And so did I still get mad over things? Of course I did. You know, did I still have anxiety and depression? Of course I did. But how I responded to them was different. I had a biblical model in order to respond to, to life choices. And in doing that, being intentional about it over a period of a year, I had a radical change in my life. I found restoration in my own kind of brokenness in the PTSD thing. 
I, I had a restoration of my marriage and my family. I found hope again. And ultimately, uh, I saw it my whole life. Why wouldn't I drink for? Was purpose. You know, we were created to have purpose. We we're meant to have purpose. Without purpose, wither up and die. And you want to know why we have the veteran suicide epidemic we have? It's not because of things that veterans seen or did on the battlefield. It's because they felt like they had purpose one day. And then one moment, they woke up and they felt that purpose was gone. And, you know, we, especially men, you know, you have that purpose in your life. One of my favorite quotes is from Mark Twain. He says, the two most important days in a person's life are the day that they're born and the day they find out why. And, uh, and for me, when Steve Toast in introduced me to the life, I believe that God created me to live, I found out the why. I found purpose again. And part of that is, you know, what we're doing right now, you know, sharing lessons I learned with others. And, uh, and it was like, for me, I was dying of cancer. And Steve Toast gave me the cure. Like, I couldn't keep that to myself. I had to share yeah. with other. And I, I learned how many other veterans were dealing with the same things I dealt with. You know, suicide rate, and divorce rate, all these other issues of PTSD and people dealing with panic attacks. I'm like, man, I got the cure. I have to share it. And I believe that in that time, God put a really deep burden on my heart to share what I discovered with others and help other veterans. And that manifested in the founding of Mighty Oaks Foundation. I got to do all the incredible things over the last 10 years that I kind of opened talking about that we get to do. And and, uh, you know, along the way, an incredible staff came along and we have the most amazing people that work for us and uh, we get to do the programming that we do around the country at five different ranches that we do it at and traveling to bases around the world and speaking to the troops. And, uh, you know, that led to uh, putting us in a position to have an organizational structure and capabilities to do great things like save our allies and go help the Afghans. And so, uh, you know, it's, but it all came down to... Uh, the personal accountability of recognizing that I was on the X, making a decision, making a choice to get off the X in the best, most effective ways possible. And, and for me, in the position, place I'm in my life right now, the best choices that I make in my life right now, or, uh, or and, uh, you know, and that's what we teach at Mighty Oaks. We teach, we're, it's not, a, even though we're a Christian program, it's not an evangelical program. Uh, we're not trying to, you know, preach to guys. We're trying to keep in our life and we're still dealt with. We I lost you again. Oh, I'm here. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, I really appreciate the stories and everything that you're the sharing with I'm us. Here. It's just this recording. Um, so my, I guess my last question would really be, what advice do you have anybody who's going through that right now? You know, the, the, the part of the, you know, feeling the lack of purpose, maybe they're transitioning out of the military um, and they feel like they no longer have that purpose or they're contemplating suicide. suicide. Like what advice would you have for those people? Um, if you could talk to them. Well, um, I'll, I'll stick to my guns here and, uh, and use some biblical advice. The Bible uh, says in Jeremiah 20, 11, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. That message uh, is kind of a God of creation, right? So if you're for your life, whether you believe that or not, he does. And as long as you have a breath in your lungs and you're still alive, that plan of purpose can be lived out. You have to, but you have to make the choice to step off the X in your life, whatever it is. And it could be a lot of things, pride, you know, uh, laziness, you know, other bad habits or, or uh, hangups in your life. It could be a lot of things, but you have to make a choice. You know what those are. No one yeah. needs to tell you, you know, you know what, whatever you're struggling with, you know, exactly what it is. No one needs, you don't need people to tell you, uh, to step off that X, step away from that struggle in your life, step into the life that I believe you're created to live and make a decision to, uh, to press forward. And there, uh, and, and when you do, you will, you know, you will be able to find purpose again. I think people that are in a place of suicide and, uh, and in that place, they feel like the situation they're in is always going to be that way. I'm always going to be depre this depressed. I'm always going to feel this hopeless, these panic attacks and this anxiety. It's always going to be that way. That's just not true. Uh, it won't always be that way. 
Um, but you have to choose to step out of it. It's not a one step and you're done. It's a, uh, but it starts with making that decision that you know, I'm not going to be here anymore and I'm going to, you know, press forward and get off that X and move forward. And when you do, you know, you can try a lot of different things. And I did, uh, and, and leave faith as the last option because that's usually what people do. But uh, if you tried everything, then I would encourage you. Uh, if what you're doing isn't working, just like I had to ask myself, right? If what I'm doing isn't working, then why not try something different? Why not give faith a chance? Why not give God a chance? And, uh, and you know, a good place for veterans to find that, how to do that is through Mighty Oaks Foundation. And uh, I'm not pitching something to sell here because everything no, is yeah. free. You, uh, you, you sign up at Mighty Oaks Foundation, it's free. Uh, we'll, we'll fly you out and, uh, it's a week of your life. What do you have to lose? Yeah. You know, so if you're on the, so I have a, I actually have a question for you. Um, so a friend of mine, I don't know, I would hope that, you know, the answer you may not, maybe you'll have to get back to me, but, um, a friend of mine is a Marine Corps veteran and he was kicked out of the Marine Corps for alcoholism and drugs. So he has, he doesn't have an honorable discharge. And he tried to go to the VA. They denied him. So he has to like, when he does try to go to counseling or anything like that, he has to pay out of pocket. Um, so is he, would he be eligible for your program or how does that, how does that work? Yes. So for us, we don't care uh, what your discharge was. We care. Okay. You raised your hand. We care. You raised your hand and made a commitment to serve your country. Uh, we don't care if you've been to combat or what your story was, what your MOS was. Uh, if you got kicked out, and even if you got kicked out for being a total idiot, uh, yeah, we don't care. Uh, we uh, believe that, you know, if you were willing to serve your country at some point, you're making a right decision, possibly something that had to do with your service led you to that decision. Maybe this guy you're talking about went to Afghanistan and came home and couldn't deal with the anxiety, tried to number with alcohol, got a DUI, got kicked out. Uh, we're not going to hold that against him because, you know, he did something for his country that not making an excuse for him, but that let him make poor decisions. We want to yeah. help him make better decisions moving forward. And awesome. so there is no, there's no discharge criteria for us. So this is a decision we made long, a long time ago, probably one of the better decisions we made. We've been able to help a lot of people who had bad discharges, uh, get back on a good trajectory for life. That's and awesome. To help everyone. Okay. All right. Well, Hey, I'll let you go. I know you're a busy man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, man, just for, you know, speaking about your story and speaking about what you guys are doing out there and thanks again. And I hope, you know, safe travels and God bless you. And I, again, thank you for your time and your words of wisdom and thanks for everything you're doing. Yep. God bless. And everybody listening, mightyoaksprograms.org. That's where you could apply and that's where you can support as well. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. You bet. Bye-bye. Thanks, buddy. Bye.